Hello, I am Amara Jones. I am the moderator for today's uh, gathering, the first ever meeting of its kind here at the United Nations on gender diversity beyond the binaries, an interactive dialogue among member states, UN entities, and civil society on the current state of LGBTQI plus rights globally here today. So welcome everyone. Um, before we start, I wanted to help to set the stage of where we are in a brief way um, globally on LGBTQI plus rights. Um, I am a journalist um, and a media maker, which means that I like to look at facts and where things are. The name of my own project is called Translash, and it's called Translash because of two things that are happening at once. It's called Transgender Backlash, but it also extends right the way across the world to issues of the other letters in the LGBTQI plus um, uh, gathering, as well as those who are gender nonconforming and non-binary. Um, we are at a stage where there is tremendous, even one could say unprecedented progress. Um, there are transgender and non-conforming people and gay people and lesbian people and bisexual people who are elected to um, offices right the way across the world from the federal level to the state level. There is a tremendous amount of advance in rights, um, not only as would be expected in the global north, but in the global south, where there have been some tremendous victories. And of course, tremendous representation in the media in ways that are also unprecedented. But it's also the fact that in an unprecedented way, the violence and the backlash is also unprecedented, and in some places around the world, historic. And that violence doesn't have a, a locale in terms of geography. There are places both in the global north and the global south that we could look at and see where there is also backsliding and a tremendous violation of human rights. And we know that where those rights are, rights are being violated, that they are at the intersections of a number of other types of human needs or rights, um, such as those focusing on race, focusing on economics, focusing on gender. And uh, additionally, we also know that in addition to those broad intersections, that there is a gender intersection in this where um, violence against LGBTQI plus people looks very much like violence against cisgender hetero, uh, heterosexual women across the world. So in this meeting, there is a lot of ground to cover to talk about the tremendous progress that has been made, but also the tremendous amount of need to do more to make sure that the rights of everyone are guaranteed and that not only the United States Nations, but the entire role of humanity as a whole lives up to the promise of valuing the humanity of everyone with dignity, respect, and a way that recognizes the fundamental value of everyone. And so that is what we're going to talk about today with this tremendous wide-ranging panel um, of people from across the world. Um, and so we will get to that. I've also been uh, asked to explain for those um, who may not necessarily be familiar what all of the letters that we'll be using. And I have to make a confession. I'll probably do an even shorter shorthand. I'm going to do LGBT plus, so forgive me, but please know that I mean to be encompassing of everyone, but what those letters stand for. So the L is for lesbian, the B is for bisexual, the gay is for, I'm sorry, the G is for, <laughs> the, the G is for gay, uh, the T is for um, transgender, the Q is for questioning or queer, the I is for intersex, um, and the plus is inclusive of pansexual, those who are um, gender nonconforming, non-binary, just the full range of gender diversities that exist. Um, um, and so that's why I think that this panel um, and what it's called uh, focusing on gender diversity is really important because we're trying to be as inclusive as possible to capture all of those who are marginalized because of who their gender, who, how they feel and express their gender, who they are, how they love. So first of all, um, thank you all for, for joining us. Um, but before we get started, we are going to have um, a uh, performance by poet K. Lundai Barrett, um, who will take us there. Hello, hello, can everybody hear me, hello? 
Yes. I've never done a mic check in the UN before. So, <laughs> oh, you check, one, two, one, two, one, two, check, check, check. Isa, taloa, talo, apat. Okay, cool. I also don't like sitting down. All right. Content warning. Um, I'm discussing astrology and bathrooms. For the longest time, I dreaded bathrooms, the bleach singeing my nostrils. I pictured my brown mama in every white person's house, scrubbing tile, making what other people took for granted shine. In airports, I clench my bladder. I could hold it until a third floor walk up in Harlem could turn bloody. See, there's this story that every trans, non-binary person knows, and it's, it's beyond guttural. It's, it's um, more than the bladder. It goes something like this. I am real. I am real. I am real. I am real. Shit, I really have to go to the bathroom. And if what they say is true, that bathrooms are where we are all our most human, then I'm a dilapidated National Geographic, barely mammal, told to leave even in the dirtiest of settings. Example, brown girl lowers her register like it's of cobwebs and steel, slouches in a baggy shirt and collar shirt, goes beeline for that stall, doesn't want to wash their hands for fear of screams, taunts, and attacks the next day and the next until their partner's hands become pillows. Because even in your dreams, even in your dreams, People still be violent. People can still get your pronouns wrong. Next. I'm told as a boy, B-O-I, that I am in the wrong place. So to drink a cup of water is a hazard in waiting. And honestly, I wish I could just shit on every curse, on every time some transgender woman turns threat when she wants to see herself in full length glory once a month. I want to be one of those obnoxious second wave white feminists. And I want to build a structure of blood that would make Rapunzel shiver. And it would take the crimson to write because all good artists, we just love, love, love the word crimson. I am real. I am real, I am real, I am real. You do not have to punch it out of me. A bruised eye like a swollen gourd, a kicked rib the density of a smashed plum. Do you know how long it can take some transgender people like me to actually accept a hug? Here is my blood. It ascends repellent stairs, for hormones or not, I am no waste of time dumping ground to let you, in your straight terrors, haunt us in a whisper. Spoiler alert, guess what? You, you, you're not real. Either you, you are not normal either. That locker room hush, that road trip bus stop stank, that fast food restaurant stain on your shirt, forgive me. I've known and lost too many trans siblings. I know how this story ends, but do we? Is it so wrong to just want to clinch your jaw in the light? to chart an altar from the new hips to the new hairline to the new hair on your chin, to sit alone on the throne, on the toilet, checking your social media. Maybe it's your OkCupid or your Tinder. I'm doing this in the UN. And you're swiping left or swiping right, depending on the city of which you live. And you don't have to go on social media and see headline and not become hashtag, not become suicide, not become missing, not become gravestone, most certainly not for my people to become ash. And though, though I'm never clean, I know for sure that I'm never clean because my colonization that forced my family here damn well made sure of that. But what I do know is this, a brown adult migrant woman and her transgender child cannot grow up in your shit. Can my family just feel the water on our knuckles like baptism? Because we as humans, woo, we are 60 to 70% water and though I'm never clean, let me tell you, the tide of the ocean beats inside my people, inside me. Look, okay, have you ever tried to contain a wave 
or date a water sign, like a Pisces? Nothing, nothing can take away our right to release. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, we will now move into the panel discussion of this program, but I've been asked to advise all of you that you can listen as well um, to the conversation with the headsets that are at each of your stations if you so wish to or um, should you need to. Um, so first to my right is Ambassador uh, Martin Garcia Moritan, who is the permanent representative of Argentina to the United Nations. Um, to, oh, to, you have special effects, Ambassador. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, to the Ambassador's right is uh, Pumzile Imlabo Ngupka, who is the Executive Director of UN Women. I'm seeing if you have sound effects uh, as well, <laughs> not quite. Um, to my right is uh, Victor Madrigal Borlos, who is the UN independent expert on protection against violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and to, we will now move to our ends. To the left of Victor is Gina Rosero, who is the founder of Gender Proud and so many other things that I'm sure we will hear about. And last, but absolutely certainly not least, um, in any way possible, <laughs> is Klakejo uh, Kai Kolonyane Kusupile. Almost. Uh, uh, who is the UN Religion Fellow um, at Outright Action International. So please welcome them all. And so Kat has now said that I can call her Kat, so I'm, I'm terribly relieved in that. Um, the first question will go to you, Ambassador. Um, when, actually, when I was doing research, one of the things that I was surprised to learn is actually Argentina's long history and um, openness to sexual orientation and gender identity, in some ways clocking back to the 1850s, I believe. Um, but that has continued um, even through modern times. So I'm wondering what are the specific policy measures um, that your country has taken recently on LGBTQI plus issues? Um, how are these playing out in your country? And do you believe that, any, that they are in any way instructive for other places around the world? Okay. Imara, thank you. Thank you very much for, for inviting me to, to this meeting. I really, um, it's for me an honor to be here. It's not the first time that I assist to these meetings, and, and it's because of the strong commitment of my, of my country to the LGBTQI uh, plus. <laughs> it works. <laughs> it works. That's fine. Yes. Uh, now I, I'm going to be used to this uh, new denomination. And, and this commitment is a, it's a long time commitment. For example, um, Argentina, jointly with the Netherlands, we are the co-chairs of the UN core group here in the UN, first. Second, we are co-chairs as well with the UK in the Equal Rights Coalition. And um, that means a lot because it's part of our work in the multilateral uh, scene. But going back to your question about what are we doing in Argentina, our commitment, of course, is also related to our, our law. For example, today is the ninth anniversary of the, ninth, of the same sex marriage that was enacted in 2009. And that means 2010. And that means that uh, I think it's the first city in, in Latin America, that, the, the second city? Huh? Well, but maybe the, the, second, the first country in Latin America that we have uh, enacted this law. And, uh, and we also 
in 2012, we uh, enacted the Gender Identity Act to bring disability, identity, and integration to trans people in our communities. And, uh, and you know that this means a lot for all the LGBTQI plus, but because this legislative initiative include the law also on comprehensive sex education, which initiates understanding of sexual diversity from a young age. Another, another initiative that we have in Argentina is the reform of the National Criminal Code to include femicide and which added sexual orientation and gender identity or expression as aggravating circumstances with increased sanctions against perpetrators. Mm -hmm. And last, repeal all, all kind of restrictions from donating, rebarring people from donating blood based on their sexual orientation. That's another uh, normative that we have in Argentina. So in the last 10, 12 years, we really improved a lot, and that, that shows our commitment on the LGBTIQR plus people. So um, I hope I can, I, with this, I has to answer your question, but be sure that we are here in the UN working all together with member states, mm -hmm. civil society, NGOs, in helping and supporting the, this, uh, this work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, just actually one, one follow-up question. It has their, in respect to these laws and the way that they're playing out in Argentina, um, is there continued to be broad-based popular support in the country, or has Argentina also experienced any type of um, um, turbulence from the implementation? No, of more and more we have the, the support of all the, all, of all the parties and most of the population. These are laws that have been uh, uh, ratify and uh, approve in the, in the Congress. So maybe you will find always some groups that are going to be against this. But the majority, I think, today is supporting this, this new, new legislative norms. Mm -hmm. um, as the head of UN Women, I'm wondering why um, and how you believe um, gender diversity fits into the larger mission of the United States and why, why it's Nations. important. I'm sorry, did I say that? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, the United Nations, I apologize. Thank you, uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome to everybody who is here. Uh, Ambassador, thank you so much for uh, 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 being here and my fellow panelists and uh, the, 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 the audience. I think for us as UN Women, this is a really important day, not just for us, we think for the United, Na United Nations as well, that we push the envelope every day to be who we were really created to be. Uh, this is uh, important for us because the UN has a unique voice to support human rights and fundamental freedoms of all people, especially those people who may have their backs against the wall. We speak up against human rights violation everywhere, and therefore it should also become natural to us that we stand with the LGBTQI plus a community and that we also see a common agenda in all the work that we do to support gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. We have a responsibility to set standards that is one of our mandates in terms of policy for member states and for nations, and we hope this too is part of a process of setting, enhancing, and consolidating some of the policies that we already have in the UN to the extent that there may be gaps, we hope that uh, this debate is part of generating a, a discussion that helps us to fill some of the gaps. Uh, we also are aware that the United Nations is not always united on all the issues, so we do not expect that all 
Member states and partners that we work with will agree with us, but that should not be a reason for us not to stand up for the truth and to push uh, uh, the envelope and ensure that uh, the equality of all genders at some point becomes the norm, the normal, and the new uh, normal. And will rise and fall with the challenges that we, are, we face and we're going to face uh, along the way. We, as UN women in general, is our position because we do have a limited mandate, pay particular attention to the situation of lesbian women, bisexual, transgender, and intersex people, and we recognize the equality of all women. Women and people with non-binary gender identities must have their own spaces to speak, to exercise power, to act, to own, and to, to drive their own movement without support. One of our responsibilities also as UN Women is to help countries change uh, uh, laws. To the extent that we still have 70 UN member states who criminalize consensual same-sex uh, acts uh, is obviously one of our challenges and uh, we have a responsibility again to work with those member states and the community activists and many enlightened people in those countries. And six UN member states impose death penalty on consensual same-sex acts. And that obviously puts the fear of the Lord on us. Mm. It just says you have to stay with this issue. As we work on ending violence against women, we see firsthand what happens to women if they do not, in many countries, they even in countries where there's proper legislation, we still know that uh, if women do not fit the, 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 the biases, the, the description that uh, uh, people may have uh, for themselves about who people should be, it puts the lives of those women at danger. So that therefore gives us the responsibility to do everything uh, that we can. We are also aware that we just cannot do this work alone. We therefore need everyone who is in and outside this room to actually be our partner and, and, and help us to navigate uh, what is still a challenging terrain. I have to say though, this year's uh, a Pride Parade was for me really one of the best. Wasn't it for many of you? The visibility was just so palpable. And I hope that uh, we're onto something. So thank you for everyone who's brought us thus far. We have a long way to go, but uh, I think we must say, you have to congratulate yourselves for pushing society thus far. Thank you. Thank you. Um, speaking of a long way to go, um, Victor, we'll, we'll move into that territory with you. Um, but there's also good news um, in that the mandate for your position as UN independent expert um, on protection against violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity, I can do that really fast, um, um, has been renewed yes. by the United Nations by an even larger vote margin. <laughs> by an even uh, larger vote margin than it was first established, which means that there's something really positive happening. Um, but recently to the General Assembly, which is the, the gathering of the, of the largest body here within the UN, um, you delivered a report on violence and discrimination against trans uh, and gender diverse people overall. Could you just tell us about the findings from that report and the situation for trans and gender diverse people um, in general? Thank you very much, and yes, I don't think that anybody is not going to be seeing me smile for the next few days at least. It's been a very nice weekend, I have to say. Uh, thank you also to the organizers for having me here. It's a great honor to be here also with such distinguished panelists. I'm particularly happy to be here with the ambassador of Argentina because through you I can pay tribute to a great leader in uh, the fight that we're describing, Lohana Berkins. Uh, this extraordinary woman was writing, um, I was reading one of her uh, writings uh, throughout the weekend, and she was being interpolated as to why she kept on being so provoking and refused to be polite. And she said something, uh, paraphrasing to the effect that she would continue exposing the insolence of her body as long as people would not understand the fragility of her life. Mm. And I think that was an extraordinary metaphor 
in the way that the fight is actually being carried out. It's the, it's the way bodies are put to the forefront of marches and, uh, and, and the way that they reflect very little how fragile lives are. And this is a little bit of the reality that I'm confronted with in the work that I have the honor to carry out. Um, I, um, as, as you very rightly mentioned, I had the honor of actually uh, studying the issue of legal recognition of gender identity. For all of you that know the mandate, uh, know that the mandate was created in the midst of very significant controversy, and that it was uh, a narrative of rupture of the world in two. And therefore, when I got the honor of being the mandate holder, I promised myself that I would carry out in a very orthodox and very square fashion. And I would always, always make sure that I fitted it very strongly within the realm of international human rights law. Mm. Because I felt that that's what would defend the mandate best in the midst of controversy. And I have to confess that my working theory was that I was going to find great difficulty of how to understand the realities and the challenges of uh, gender, gender diverse life within the confines. And I was double surprised to actually find that that framework is absolutely um, adequate to deal with the needs and demands, the rightful demands of transgender non-conforming non-binary persons. The reality of matters is that all of this makes reference to very simple principles of international law, amongst them the idea of freedom in life, the ability of freely determining one's identity, and the idea of autonomy that is so linked to the notion that nobody's life is to be determined by the circumstances in or with which you're born. That there is no inextricable relation between a particular genital configuration and the role that you have to play within a society. That there is freedom and autonomy to be implemented in each and every moment of our lives. And this is a vigorous human rights framework. It's not something new. It's not something that we're inventing. It's something that is existing in every treaty that we have. And what this results on is uh, an extrapolation in international law, which is the fact that we all have the right to be unique mm. and distinguishable from every other person in the seven billion persons in the world. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that there is not such a thing as a particular determination that we have to follow through. Mm -hmm. This is the international law foundation that I described in my report to the General Assembly last year. I was delighted to see that report so well received uh, at the seat of the Third Committee of the United Nations. Now, a couple of very quick points um, before I leave this first uh, um, uh, answer, and that is, that is the theory. But of course, the practice that I found in all of the information that I received was a diamet diametrically opposed to it. What I found was a situation that I did not hesitate to qualify as offensive to human conscience. conscience. Mm -hmm. And the levels of violence and discrimination to which trans, gender diverse persons and non-binary persons are uh, subjected to in every corner of the world, sometimes bog resists belief and boggles the mind. Um, bullied at school, rejected by families, pushed onto the streets, denied access to employment, every sector I can describe to you the level of exclusion that is actually enabled by systems that are actually uh, permitting, encouraging and rewarding violence and discrimination against trans persons. I will uh, talk a little bit uh, uh, more uh, about what can we do to remedy this, but that asymmetry between that vigorous framework of protection and the realities is, of course, the challenge that we are all facing in uh, our everyday uh, work and a situation that I would qualify as of a fundamental rupture of um, the rights uh, that, are, that all persons actually have, uh, are entitled to. Thank you uh, for grounding us into some pretty substantial realities. 
Before we move on to the next question, I've been asked to do yet another uh, bit of housekeeping, which is that throughout, you should feel free to broaden this conversation on social media by using the hashtag beyond binaries, which is, of course, right in front of you to be, um, to be used. So please do that. Um, one of the struggles that you're highlighting in terms of the violence and the, at the center of that, of course, is, um, is dehumanization. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's really good to turn to you now, um, Kat, because what you do through storytelling, through your artistry, is about highlighting, um, highlighting the humanity of people um, and hum who, highlighting our humanity. Um, and so as a multidisciplinary performance art artist and activist, an artivist. Um, what is your approach when advocating for our rights, for humanizing us, and for um, giving people insights into who we are? Thank you very much, Mara. Um, I just wanted to say, so part of my artistic practice is rooted in something that, you know, colonial power told us we shouldn't be doing, which was, you know, really working from within our cultures. So um, as a Botswana and looking at cultural practices in Botswana, consultancy is a huge part of how we form identities. Um, it's a huge part of how we build communities. It's a huge part of how we essentially create families. And that's where I root my activism as well as my creative practice in that before there's words for you, you cannot exist. Um, and so we all know that colonial um, oppressions resulted in a lot of erasure of language, which is fundamental to identity creation. And so a lot of my work has been around trying to influence cultural shifts um, and social shifts in a way where we're not just leaving it to the law, um, as the ambassador spoke about. You know, we're not just leaving it to the law to identify and recognize people so that they could be visible. Um, we are not just leaving it to the, to the academy to study us as subjects and objects, but for us to, in and of our own languages, to be able to offer ourselves space to be um, reflected as well as recognized. So with the activism work, it's been about also getting people on the ground to really understand how to speak, because what, what a law says and what your mother hears are not the same thing. What the law says and what your best friend will say to their parents is not the same thing. Um, just earlier, somebody asked me about, you know, how do we build allyship? And I said, allies are not people who should be speaking on behalf of LGBTQI plus people. They should be people who feel confident enough to refer whoever is questioning them to an LGBTQI plus person um, to then be in that space. Because if allies are forever speaking about us, then we're not able to fully be understood. We will remain concepts. So within my work, it's been really about trying to get people to recognize that trans people aren't just surgery, psychoanalysis, body politic. Um, some of us really do care about the climate. Some of us really do care about farming. Some of us really do care about fashion. Um, we're not just entertainment pieces. We are whole human beings. And if you don't allow trans and gender diverse persons to really be more than just the politic of you trying to understand how and when they exist, you then cease to let them fully exist. So that's what I've been really trying to get people to do um, and pushing, as you know, Mampum Zile said, you know, pushing the envelope to say, um, how do we really, really push it to the point of being able to be in these spaces, right? We're making history today. Um, the ambassador and I and others made history earlier in March um, by putting trans bodies within this institution. So how do we keep going forward? But for us to really be understood as not just, hey, what is your preferred pronoun? <laughs> um, one of the things that you, um, that, that Kat just spoke about, um, Gina, is the importance of um, language and images 
to broaden out people's understanding beyond gender pronoun, if they're even there, um, in terms of who we are. And one of the things that you've done through um, Gender Proud um, is work with a, a major media conglomerate, Viacom, in order to do that. Um, and so can you um, just tell us about why you believe it's necessary to do um, what um, Kat spoke about at scale through partnerships with these larger organizations? Sure. Um, first of all, I just want to say that I'm, I'm here in this space and recognizing this moment as a very proud transgender woman of color, born and raised in the Philippines. I am an immigrant. I'm a proud immigrant to be here in this space. I think it's important for me to, to recognize that in this moment where immigrant identity are being attacked. Um, I have to say um, the journey of getting me to starting Gender Proud as both an advocacy um, platform, also as a media production, is really through my personal experience. I believe, you know, dignified and nuanced and accurate representation of trans and gender diverse people saves lives. It could save thousands, all of our lives, right? I mean, GLAD Media, a media advocacy organization, just to pause it here in the United States, did a study that 84% of Americans doesn't know a trans person, mm -hmm. right? And most of those things, the first interaction is really through mass media, right? So if you're not getting the accurate representation, you know you're just being dehumanized. Mm -hmm. You know, as someone born and raised in the Philippines, it's been a long journey in, in me recognizing the power in my identity, in being the pride that I have in my identity. And I think even, I'm, I'm speaking just specifically here in the US and also because of my experience growing up in the Philippines. You know, there, we ha we're having a conversation right now in the US and it should be, I, I believe, in all over the world about storytelling, about representation, right? It's one thing to see yourself in media, which is important, to recognize who you are, to, to see yourself represented and celebrated, but the bigger issue is that who's telling those stories, right? It's important, we've, we've, I, I could name names of, of so many examples, but like it's problematic we, when there's actually people that are being represented about the story and they're not being represented behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. it's, important. it's much more important to have that full scope of representation, not just in front, but also behind the scenes. I was born and raised in the Philippines. I grew up in a country that have a very mainstream cultural visibility of transgender people. I came from a culture of transgender beauty pageants in the Philippines. I mean, I've joined them all, basically. <laughs> I was one of the most prominent beauty queen in the Philippines. But then, growing up in the Philippines, in a country, majority Catholic country, right? We have a culture of transgender beauty pageants that happens in the most conservative Catholic religion, tradition, and celebration, right? Mm -hmm. We have a culture where you could basically go in a traditional uh, Catholic fiesta celebration, right? Or people would, you know, watch a trans beauty pageant on national television, right? They would, they, there's this cultural, almost a dichotomy of representation, right? And as someone who was uh, experiences at such a young age, at 15 years old, joining trans pageants allowed me to be who I am, right? But then when I moved to the United States, it's it presented a completely different context. And I like to always say that being trans in the Philippines is culturally visible, but not politically recognized. Mm -hmm. There are still no rights for trans people to exist as we are. We can't change name and gender marker. There are no legal protections for discrimination. But when I moved to uh, California specifically, it was almost the other way around. There was a degree of political recognition, meaning I was able to change my name and gender marker on legal documents, but there was no cultural visibility in the United States. I remember the first cultural visibility that I saw representation of trans people on TV was there is a variety, I mean, a horrible TV show called Jerry Springer. And the first times I saw trans women in that show was this is how I'm going to be treated here, which is always about predicated upon that like I am not a full human being. I'm not the woman that I am. It's always about me trying to just force myself in telling the world that this is who I am, you know? This is who I am. I don't need to debate anybody about who I am. Right? So it presented this very different cultural context that when I moved to the United States, I had to grapple with different cultural realities. But then I had a big dream. I wanted to be here in New York City and pursue my dream as a model. Right? But also I made the decision because at that time in 2005, there was not an out trans identified fashion model. 
So I made the decision to not share my story as a transgender woman with my model agent in the fashion industry. And yes, I've lived my dream in being a fashion model, but also for so many years I was living, I felt like I was living this double life, right? Because yes, I was a successful fashion model, but then there's this other reality that I felt like I was keeping. Even my model agent at the time did not know I was trans. Mm -hmm. And I remember the bigger the job that I would do, the bigger the paranoia. Mm -hmm. I did a big um, cosmetic campaign and you know, a moment that should have been a celebration for a, a fashion model. I remember at home feeling so depressed and feeling so scared that somebody would say something, that I would get outed. And I think, at certain point, when you do, when you go through this, it does something to your psyche, right? I went on my journey. I, I was depressed, and I realized that after so many years of seven years of being a fashion model in New York City, I've had enough. So I made the decision to use the biggest platform that I could think of. I gave a TED talk. I came out as a as a proud trans woman, and it changed my life. And from that moment on, I I I, I told myself that. It can't just stop on a TED Talk. I, I wanted to give back to the community and the family that I've been given. I launched Gender Proud to both advocate for gender recognition law all over the world, and also making sure that there's a connection when it comes to media representation. And I just want to specifically say one, pro one project that we did with uh, Fusion Network was really looking into the experiences and stories of transgender women in, in New York about their employment process, right? This one particular woman named Alexis who was a manager in an ice cream parlor for 15 years. She decided to transition and she got fired, right? And I think to posit that from, a, from the context of like what people are experiencing, what trans people are experiencing, which is what we know, right? Th trans women of color experience unemployment rate three times the national average here in the United States. So as a, now as a producer, now as someone who gets to tell stories and, and put your team together, I, I, it is my responsibility to always center the most marginalized in my community. Right? The story of Alexis, a woman who actually, um, an immigrant from Argentina, was brilliant, uh, cum laude in her school, was working as a manager and then she decided to transition and she got fired. Mm -hmm. And she ended up um, uh, working in uh, collecting trash just to survive. And I think, I, I, as I mentioned, I want to center the narratives of the and people in my community, the most marginalized in my community, because if we don't do that, we really don't get to deconstruct all these intersecting layers of institutional transphobia, racism, sexism, ableism. It's, it, if, if we're gonna use media as, as an advocacy tool, I wanna center the narratives of the most marginalized. Ambassador, you mentioned that there's a legal framework um, in Argentina, that that framework is unfolding in a variety of ways and areas, that it has you know, broad-based support um, from the public at large, even after implementation. And so I'm wondering if um, there's anything that you believe that's instructive about the Argentinian experience for other countries um, around the world, and if there is a broader um, effort by countries like yours who do have these models to share them with others? Yes, of course. Um, this is what we try to do, to share our experience and to try to cooperate with other states. For example, the HLPF, now, as you know, we are in the last week of HLPF, and this provides this meeting a unique opportunity to discuss this issue since it gathers UN member states, civil society and UN agencies. So this is a beginning mm. where you can bring this issue to the UN and discuss it with the member states. And as I said before, we have a UN core group and we have the Equal Rights Coalition, the first that we joined with Netherlands and the second with UK and, and, and our our commitment is to try to bring to these groups more and more member states and to work together in the international arena, trying to, 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 to work uh, against any kind of discrimination and mm -hmm. try also the 
uh, this increasing of our membership uh, will mean not only to have larger growth, but also to give more visibility mm -hmm. to this problem. And despite that the progress of, in our group, we are aware that there is still room for improvement, both in, on the national and international scope. For example, uh, it's, it's very important, the last report of, of our friend Victor Madrigal, that shed light and provide useful insights on the importance to collect data with a view to access the situation of LGBT persons. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of work that the member states all together with you, Victor, we should do to try to, 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 to make not only the visibility of this problem, but also to help to, to provide a solution in all those countries where the, the trans people, the gay people, the, the LGBTI persons really, really feel discriminated and in so many cases their lives are in danger. Thank you. Um, um, uh, the ambassador spoke about the way in which um, countries through this core working group are coming together, um, working together. Um, and one of the questions that I have um, for you is, in terms of coalescing and coming together, we, we know that a lot of the violence against people who are trans and gender diverse, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, is intersectional, that it collides with a lot of other um, human needs, wants, and that in order to secure these rights, we have to work um, intersectionally. How do you think that we can fold that into um, advancing LGBTQI plus rights, um, and um, what would you say is the centrality of doing that? Well, let me start uh, by highlighting the fact that UN Women as a feminist organization cannot be a feminist organization and a homophobic, a feminist organization and not have a stand or, uh, uh, concretely supporting people with disability. You cannot be, I don't even think you can be a feminist and not care about climate. Uh, you cannot be a feminist and not care about uh, people who are living with the stigma and other challenges of living with HIV AIDS. Be a feminist and not be concerned about the discrimination of people because they are migrants. Rights are rights and they're indivisible. Mm -hmm. And we have to build... have to build this narrative in the way we live, in the way we implement programs, in the way in which we articulate policy. And I'll be first one to say it is not always easy. Sometimes, you know, you get resources that are compact, compact, compartmentalized. So it's, uh, it's resources for you to address disability or to address that. And that can sometimes force you into this kind of uh, chopping a person into different pieces. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're trying to do by telling a coherent story about everything that a person is, is to pull one person together with who, who everything that they come with as a human being, their soul and bones uh, 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 together. Uh, and nowhere is this more pertinent at this moment than when we are talking about uh, the non-binary non, non struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that uh, women who are non-gender conforming are likely to be at higher risk uh, when it comes into physical violence, rape, Men as well, uh, who, who are non-binary, uh, compared to other men who may face uh, uh, GBV. We have reports, for instance, in countries like Japan, Malaysia, Pakistan, and the Philippines, that also have indicated the high rate of sexual intrafamily violence as a major concern. And women generally are not safe at home in many countries because we have high rates of domestic violence it is even worse and higher, uh, higher rates for women who are 
non-binary. So when we talk about domestic violence, for instance, then we therefore have to make sure that uh, we go that, uh, that, that extra mile. When women migrate and are displaced, their vulnerability is exacerbated. Uh, when women uh, are forced into countries where the laws discriminate and criminalize uh, uh, them because of their, of their gender identity, these, the, the struggles are, 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 are even more complex. And that is why for us, the issue of uh, dealing with the laws, because we deal with governments, because we are an intergovernmental body, if we don't do anything else, because governments are the only ones who legislate, let's get the laws right. But also knowing that that's not enough. Because good laws can be sabotaged by bad norms, mm -hmm. culture, and attitude. So we just need to cover all the bases all the time with everybody who is willing and able to work with us. And I also like to, to emphasize the importance of making sure that we don't give the people whom, who are against the rights who are fighting for a reason to get even further from us. So there's also sometimes strategic choices that we have to have in order to keep as many people going the right way rather than sometimes taking the stance that would uh, push a lot of people. And that, those, there's always choices there that you have to make. When do you compromise rights because you're trying to win people? And when do you uh, uh, affirm and stand for your rights and then you, you risk uh, you know, increasing uh, the negative reaction? And this is part of the wisdom that we want to gain from everybody. How do you navigate uh, the space? Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Victor, one of the things that um, Funzile just spoke about was the, the trade-offs and the navigation um, and trying to make sure that everyone can move together. And so um, how do you think that that can be done? And how do we work together, um, given your experience um, in this unique role from that bird's eye view of how to do that? Thank you. Yes, I was reflecting precisely on that. I think that uh, integrating different approaches is clearly one of the ways to move forward. Uh, the mandate that I have the honor to carry out actually brings one of those dimensions, it's only one, mm. uh, and that is understanding how the framework of international human rights law works within this setting. But of course, there's a multiplicity of other dimensions that need to be explored. And just like a person's infinite complexity cannot be explained just by one identity. We are many identities in one body. Mm. The problem and the solution is also multidimensional in its nature. Um, a couple of, of ideas that I think are important to reflect in this. The first one is, when speaking about gender, I think it's important that we reflect on the notion that it most likely than not is, is going to be about power. It's about the way power is structured in society and the way that power is predetermined to reside in certain hands because of certain configurations. And so I believe that one of the issues that my mandate grapples with is the fact that th speaking about gender identity is very much speaking about the aspirations of persons in relation to power mm. independent of their particular bodies. In a way, it's interesting because it almost matches religious thinking when it, when, when it actually relates about transcendence. Mm. Having said that, we need to make that descent to the point of view of the law, and the fact is the law is actually there to ensure that everybody has the same rights to actually accede to power. If, and that's the basis of democratic thinking and equality and being free and equal and so on and so forth. Second point, key matter in this aspect, the ambassador, thank you for mentioning it, is that data is key. Allow me to share with you very quickly my experience when I worked at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and we created the Registry of Violence. We realized that the reason why in many countries in the region there appeared to be no killing of trans persons, women or men, is because persons were actually being classified according to the sex assigned at birth which meant basically that their whole existence became invisible. When we actually began to advise on the protocols to register persons according to their gender identity, 
the situation immediately became visible and it revealed to be disastrous. Something that of course was of immediate concern to the countries in the region that wanted to ensure their human rights of the persons living under their jurisdiction. So data is fundamental, but how can you get data when you deny the existence of LGBT or gender diverse persons? Mm. How will you get the willingness for countries to actually gather data when the expression is such people do not exist in my country? So the negation is a particular challenge when it comes to this issue. Um, apart from that, in the particular of um, gender diversity, I think that uh, what, what I came out uh, concluding in my research is that the way forward actually needs to take into account the way that these meta systems have been created to actually impose certain structures of power. And these meta systems work on three, mainly three types of structures, and those are medicalization or pathologization, criminalization, and demonization. So what in my report I actually reveal is the fact that there has been a whole movement to ensure that there's a conviction created in society that trans or gender diverse persons are disordered, mm -hmm. ill. And we know that significant uh, efforts are being now done to depathologize trans and gender diverse identities. The World Health Organization has taken gender dysphoria out of the chapter of mental disorders, but what's the problem? The problem is that we have decades of permeating into the thinking and the global imaginary. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that uh, gender diverse persons and trans persons are in some way disordered is deeply rooted into the collective thinking. So we need to fight against that. Second is criminalization. Uh, the director, of course, mentioned the fact that 69 countries still criminalize, but a lot more actually have legislation that have criminalizing impact. So legislation on social mores or good customs or uh, condemning cross-dressing are, of course, criminalizing in their effects, and we need to work with that. And finally, there's the idea that certain life experiences are sinful by their nature, and this, of course, also has deep impact in the way that societies actually create exclusion. And this is the way that we actually need to, to work. There's no one set um, formula, but I have to say that clearly work needs to go on in all of these dimensions. So my advice to states has been to the effect of working on the threads of depathologization, elimination of criminalizing provisions, working on measures of social inclusion, including working with faith-based groups, and ensuring the elimination of abusive requirements for legal gender recognition. That seems to be the elements in the equation to actually move forward in a way that actually would be holistic in nature. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the conversations before both... Oh. Um, um, I got so lost in the conversation. One of the, the two things that were brought up by both Victor um, um, and Pum, uh, Pumazi are the necessity to um, uh, listen and connect with other people to help guide the efforts of what's happening. Um, you are in a unique role where you're an outside person on the inside. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, on the inside of the United Nations, I should specify for people <laughs> who don't know, um, through a variety of roles. Um, and so I'm wondering, how do you feed into these structures, right, that may not necessarily be meant to be um, reflective and, um, and flexible to voices like yours, but at the same time, as we've heard on this panel, that is essential. So I think there's a very interesting thing that, um, and I'm happy that Victor said what Victor said because I don't have to say it. Um, <laughs> there, there's this, there's this thing of people not quite understanding that, as I said earlier, you know, the language language is really such a a, a valuable tool that if you don't know how to speak diplomatic speak, you will not be able to get the diplomats to hear you. Um, and unfortunately, if they're not listening to you, they can say whatever they want to say. You can say whatever you want to say, they will say, mm -mm, yes, yes, and still do nothing, right? Um, so, and as has been stated, you know, there's this idea of we are, as, as trans and gender non-conforming persons, people living beyond the binary, um, 
we're trying to just get to the point of existing without needing qualifications for our, existen our existence. Um, so how then do we get to that point without being seen as these super rebels, right? So when we say, um, I've been accused of being a gender abolitionist a few times because I'm just like, well, if everyone is just trans, well, assumed trans until proven otherwise, then the world would really just be a better space, right? Um, why is it that when, as a woman, you wear pants with a blazer, it's called a pant suit, but the ambassador's not wearing a pant suit, the ambassador's wearing a suit? You know, so just those little things of, we need to... But we can't confirm that he is wearing pants. <laughs> well, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so, so I think that the value of being, you know, this, this outsider on the inside and, you know, with, um, as Victor said as well, we, we need to really work with faith-based um, communities. The Outright Fellowship that I'm on as a UN Religion Fellow is really to look at the spaces where it might not be explicit where the source of this transphobia or um, homophobia is from, but it's there and it's being fed through little things. So you go, the person you go to church with doesn't mind you, but they don't mind you because they're now being fed the whole hate the sinner, hate the sin, not the sinner, right? Mm -hmm. And so how do you then start changing the way people look at you and understand those, um, the fact that that is wrong in and of itself to say, well, you know, I like you, but I don't like the way you live your life. Your lifestyle is offensive to me. Um, and for us to not then say, well, your lifestyle is offensive to me, <laughs> you know, um, because essentially queer people aren't the, one having, aren't the ones having queer babies. Um, it's all the other people who then come to us. <laughs> so... So, so in terms of how do we bridge it, it really is about getting into the spaces but not apologizing for being there, firstly. Um, and for it to be really understood that, you know, when people say, oh, do you think Africa's ready to have a queer president? If we look statistically, Africa's already had a queer president. Nobody knew about it, but Africa's already had a queer president. Uh, the world had queer presidents. Um, but... Our visibility should not be because we need to prove a point to the cishets out there who want to then believe that, oh, you guys exist and you're just like us. Um, we are more than you. And essentially, you need to learn how to become a bit more like us. Yeah. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> you answered my question and more. So yeah, I, I think that that is uh, that that's it. And just to clarify for people who may not know, um, when you said cis het, you mean people who are cis heterosexual. Cis are people who identify with the gender assigned at birth, and heterosexual are people who are attracted to those um, of the opposite sex. So just so that everyone knows, um, in terms of um, this is a learning conference. Um, one of the um, Gina one. Um, the last question actually goes to you, and that is um, of this particular round before we turn it over to you all. Um, just in general, as a person, we spoke to a person who is an outsider kind of on the inside, but as an outsider on the outside, what just in general with your broad experience of living both in the, the, the global north and the global south um, and the journey that you've traveled, what do you think an institution like the UN needs to be doing better to advocate for people like you when you were young? Yeah. Um, oh. It takes me back to, I, I guess, growing up in the Philippines, right? You've always dreamed of wanting to be recognized as the person that you are, right? And to now be here, sitting here, and been so privileged to have worked with different uh, UN entities in, in the past many years of my life, um, and getting familiar with, with some of the processes, I think, I mean, there's many things, but I could name some. I think that would help. I think we need definitely would love to see more trans and gender non-conforming people in positions of power here in United States, United Nations. I think the realities of what the data that we've seen um, about the violence and the discrimination that my community experiences, I think it's important and critical, utmost critical to get funding for trans and gender non-conforming, gender diverse led organizations. I think within the context of, of global um, activism and 
it's important to always consult the local organizations, right? They know better on what needs to be done, right? And I think as, as someone who, you know, have interacted with many entities here, it, it is critical to always claim that, that, that's, that space of really asking those questions that we need to really go to the very um, uh, nature of like what people are going through all over the world. Right, and, and, and you know, propose policies that mandates access to health for trans and gender diverse people. I mean, just have to be specific, I mean, I grew up in the Philippines. Um, we're experiencing an H HIV epidemic in the Philippines. It's the fastest growth rate of HIV epidemic in, in all of Asia Pacific, especially young people are experiencing this. Um, I grew up in the Philippines with no access to health. We had to self-medicate our hormones and most of my friends died because we didn't know anything, right? There are studies and studies that's been said that you know, more than 80% of trans people, we have to even educate our, our medical provider. That, that shouldn't be that way, right? And um, currently, I have a country in the Philippines, a country of 106 million population, speaking with so many um, on-the-ground organizations like Trans Man Pilipinas, um, where we live, there's endocrinologists that I could count in my hand that supports trans people. The disparity is even beyond in the consumption of thinking, of conscious thinking, right? There, it's so much that needs to be done. And I think just to, to, to close out, we're talking about language. There's so many conversations that we're speaking about language. And I myself am passionate in, in, in learning more and decolonizing my understanding of, of language. I was as born and raised in the Philippines, a country that's been colonized, a country that's been for so long have indigenous understanding of gender fluidity. In the Philippines, we have many different dialects. We have a, the, our main um, language called Tagalog. We have this word called Sia, is spelled as S-I-Y-A. Sia is basically them. We, we, we're a gender neutral language in the Philippines. And the, 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 the Tagalog, which is our language, is part of this long history of, of Austronesian language family that's spoken by more than 500 million people that have gender neutral on their language. Gender neutral identities, them identifying with preferred pronoun, it's nothing new when it comes to the context of indigenous people. So. So I just want to like just close out by saying that trans people and gender diverse people have always been here since the beginning of time. Decolonizing that understanding with us to realize, oh, that is the way forward, right? It's to decolonize that understanding, right? And honor the long history of my ancestors that have been here way before me that not only exists in the Philippines, but exists here in the United States, the two-spirit Native American communities, right? The Katois in India, the Hijra, the Katois in Thailand, excuse me, and Hijra in India, the Fafafine in um, the Polynesian um, nation. I just want to reclaim that space of gender fluidity that's always been here since the beginning. Great, thank you. Um, so now we're going to move to the question and answer um, and discussion portion of, um, of this particular gathering. We have not a lot of time, unfortunately, just 15 minutes. So we are going to ask um, those uh, who wish to speak um, either in a question or a comment to keep it extremely brief. Um, if it's not brief, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to interrupt because we wanna try to move through as many um, of those as possible. So I'm apologizing you to you in advance if I have to do that, So, but hopefully I won't have to. But in advance of that, we will be let off in this particular um, Q&A session. Um, with um, just uh, a brief thought from the permanent representative um, to the United uh, Nations from the United Kingdom, um, Ambassador James Roscoe. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, it, I think it's quite difficult as an ambassador and a representative of a former colonial power to come into this conversation um, in some ways. Um, when the testimonies we've heard are so um, powerful and, and pragmatic, um, because ultimately we're here to represent countries and to represent people and to see um, what we can do to help them. But I think, I think the UK, um, whatever our history is now, 
at the forefront of um, trying to take a lead on this issue. Um, and we attach great importance to the enjoyment of human rights by, by all people on a free and equal basis. And that's what drives our thinking on LGBT issues, because LGBT people are not in any circumstances asking for special rights. They're just asking to be accorded the same dignity, respect, and rights as all citizens. And that's what drives, drives our thinking. Um, but I think that despite uh, some recent advances in this area, um, transgender people still continue to face significant barriers, and we've heard about a lot of those um, today. And that, that stands true in the UK as it does everywhere else. And I think the challenge to us is to, is to listen and to take up uh, the gauntlet of doing more. Um, I think we have a strong legislative framework in the UK. Um, we've had um, a Gender Equality Act since 2010. Um, and we try and do what we can to help countries who want to work with us to bring forward their own gender equality legislation uh, to do so. Um, but we still have a huge problem. We still have massive bullying in our schools. Um, and I think we, we did some work the other day that discovered that 40% of children in the UK have seen other children or, or themselves being bullied because of their um, identity, because of their gender identity, which is, which is astonishing and depressing. And that's why the UK is spending multiple millions of pounds um, trying to educate people in primary schools and in senior schools about these issues. And I think education should be at the heart of what we do. Because Victor talked about the legal framework. We've got the legal framework right in the UK, but this isn't just about legality, it's about culture. And we've got to change um, the cultures uh, in our society because it's unacceptable that anyone should face discrimination or violence because of their um, orientation. Um, just to touch on the UN for a second, of course, the UN um, adopted uh, the SDGs back in 2015, and they talk about leaving no one behind. Well, that should be at the front of our minds when we think about these issues. We need to leave no one behind, and that includes many of the people um, represented in this room and the communities that they represent. They have to be at the heart of our thinking. Um, so it's important um, that governments don't limit the contributions that can come from their societies by not representing and recognizing all those um, in their societies. Um, I just wanted to touch briefly on, on the, the other thing the UK thinks is very important, and that is to, to speak out um, and to be at the vanguard of um, this movement um, as a country. And it was for that reason that um, we've marched for a number of years in, the, um, in World Pride. We were in World Pride this year. If some of you were still around at 10 o'clock, uh, that's when we managed to get past um, Stonewall, um, having waited several hours. Uh, Bonnie behind me organized it, but it was a fantastic event, and it's important for us as a, as a country to show um, that we believe. Um, we also um, have a party every year here in New York. It's called the Queen's Birthday Party, or the QBP. Well, this year we made it the LGBT QBP, um, and for anyone who was there, um, we had a rather wonderful um, singer called Pablo Vittar, who you may have heard of, um, and she put on an incredible show, but I think also um, showed the UN and diplomats across the UN what she was all about and what she believed in, and it was a really wonderful event. Um, we've already talked about the Italian, uh, sorry, the Argentine ambassador has mentioned um, the Global Equality Caucus, um, which we're, we're co-leading. We want to use that um, to push this agenda as well, um, and the Equal Rights Coalition, um, which we co-chair um, with Argentina. Um, now, I want to just mention one last thing, and that's that we're planning an international LGBT human rights conference um, in the UK in 2020. Um, and we'll keep on having this conversation, but hopefully we can all get together in London next year and amplify this conversation even more. Thank you very much. And we also wanted to recognize um, Tony Kruger Aye Bazebewe, who is the executive director of the Global Interfaith Network for People of All Sexes, Sexual Orientations, Gender Identities, and Expressions. Where are they? Where are you, Tony? Oh, okay. I think. Yes. Yes. So thank you very much, and thank you very much to all of you. There was a very rich and wonderful discussion.
Um, so I, it was just really lovely to hear it. Um, I just want to say two or three things from a faith-based perspective. Um, the Global Interfaith Network is a network of LGBTIQ plus 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 people of faith. Um, Victor and the others have spoken a lot about violence against trans, um, intersex, and non-binary people. And there is no faith tradition in the world that supports violence. In its purest form, no faith tradition supports violence or discrimination against people. And so these faith traditions that we are so often confronted with, which do support violence against um, LGBTIQ++ people, are in some fundamental way perversions of what was intended by these systems, which are supposed to reflect the most profound and beautiful and respectful ways of being human, the most loving ways of being human. That is what all of these faith traditions are there for. They hold a fundamental idea of what it means to be a dignified, beautiful human being, in many cases created in the image of the divine. The violence that comes out of these traditions is not something that should be coming out of these traditions. I think that it is really interesting, the contrast between the pre-colonial traditions which were so affirming, you know, and what has remained of so many of the colonial religious traditions. I myself am a person of faith, so I speak out of that position. You know? But speaking out of that position, I recognize that we are not bringing the beauty of our traditions to the fore when we discriminate against people. I think that we need more trans, intersex, non-binary theologians in our many faith traditions because I think that it is important that people must speak out of their own embodied realities to those faith traditions. And as the Global Interfaith Network, we are committed to doing that work of finding and supporting and amplifying those voices. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. And so now we will open it up to the floor for questions. Um, you raised your hand in the back first. You then we'll come around this side. So I have one, two, three, four, five. We'll try to get. Yeah, we'll do what we can. Um, I am Marco Palu. I am from Argentina. I am from a very tiny town in the north, from Jujuy. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that everybody um, knows a little bit what the experience of living in Argentina and being a person from this community is like. And I think uh, opposed to what Gina's experience is in Argentina, I think the community is politically recognized but not culturally visible. And it's one of the most homophobic um, cultures that I've seen. It's very misogynistic and I've never felt safe or loved by while living there. Um, when I told my mom that I was gay, she immediately thought that you get HIV just by having sex with another man, and she was just not informed in any way as of what it was like to be gay, what it meant. Um, and I just think it's... Uh, also, one thing is what's happening in Buenos Aires, but a very different thing is what's happening on the rest of the country. And one thing is the experience of someone white who's LGBTQ in, in the country, and it is so different from a person of color over there. Um, very sadly, it's a very, it's almost openly racist as a country, which I'm very ashamed to say because I am from there. And um, I grew up seeing it 
but um, I don't know how we can change this because I think it's so imprinted in the culture and it's, you know, the, the government might want to change it, but I think maybe the media can do better. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take three in a row and then allow the panel to respond. And if we have time, take another three. So you and then you are next. There we go. The red button. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Derek Reyes, and I lead a company called Coily Health. It is a digital health company that specifically was designed to democratize access to health and wellness for the LGBTQ community. Um, so Gina, thank you for your comments on, on health and wellness. So I'm wondering, uh, how, how do we, the private sector, leverage our access, power, and privilege to influence pro-social movements, especially for the LGBTQ community, and also policy from a legislative point of view, um, especially in regions of the planet that have LGBT, every place has an LGBTQ population, but there are some where LGBTQ people are heavily policed, heavily monitored, and completely erased almost. So how do we, how do we do that? Okay. Uh, red button. Yeah. Um, uh, my name is uh, Marty Cummings, and I'm a political activist here in the city. And my question is, uh, well, first of all, thank you, all of you. Um, you know, it's good to see that there's so many countries that are supportive of this, and as somebody from the United States, I'd like to believe that my country is, but seeing as our current administration is openly uh, transphobic, and we have an epidemic of trans women of color being murdered uh, in the United States, how can we ensure that the United Nations is gonna hold the US um, accountable for the actions of this administration and what is going on? We're supposed to be a supportive country, but, um, we're not living up to our, our ideals. So what can we do uh, to keep on track? Mm -hmm. um, so we had three uh, sessions, and it should actually, uh, questions rather, it should be jump ball if we can keep the answers short. How do we close the gap between what's happening on the ground and legally in certain places like Argentina? How can the private sector um, leverage its power and privilege in advancing um, these particular rights? And how um, is the way that the United Nations can hold the United States accountable for um, perceived violations in human rights? I mean, I'll take the one on the private sector, just a quick mm -hmm. bit. So the beauty of the private sector is the fact that you are highly capitalist, right? So you're there for the money. You need to recognize that and not be ashamed of it, and then recognize that the people who aren't there for the money need the money that you can like put aside. Um, we're not here to ask to, to be like you know your tax exemption, but be very, very conscious of saying, well, $50 a month to me doesn't mean a lot, but $50 a month to uh, Marty Cummings, for example, uh, to go print posters and flyers and whatever and go do some advocacy is $50 that Marty has saved, yeah? So finding those path pathways to at least get people who need the money to get the money and it doesn't have to be this, this great thing of, you know, grand, grand grants are, are a huge thing where it's like $50,000. And I'm like, I don't need 50,000, I just need five. And nobody wants to just give you 5,000. Well, I take 50 and then, you know, it's mismanaged and then, you know, it shuts the door for somebody else. So really look at how best to, to use the money you've got to go the furthest. Great. Um. Yeah, Victor, and um, I believe that the ambassador and the executive director have a heart out at five, so that leaves us just a few minutes to get through these questions. Just very quickly, um, I'm always available for further. Um, it's what I'm requested to do is to maintain always every door, every window. I always raise the roof in the Human Rights Council. It's a joke that never works. Here it works. <laughs> see, see, audience is everything in life. Um, having said that, very quickly to, to mention to, to you, um, 
the beauty about the United Nations, the reason why it's a patrimony that is so exquisite and so deserving of being defended, is that there is no exclusion on the countries that will get our advice. Um, there's a vigorous human rights framework, a vigorous human rights work framework that is made of the UPR and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, of the special procedures, of which I'm one of many, um, and of course the treaty bodies. And all of that machinery is there to be used. And of course, I will provide advice to those that are saying that they're not listening, to those that are saying that they are listening. The idea is that there's no limitation. And what we need to do to engage is to actually get the information as to what may be happening on the ground so that we can concern uh, ourselves. So it is important for me to say that the machinery is there to be used from the standpoint of the United Nations, and it has no exclusions. No country in the world is not subject to that uh, advice and scrutiny. Um, I just want to add about the private sector um, question. Um, I think it's an important conversation that we're having now. It's 50th anniversary of Stonewall just happened. World Pride just happened. Pride just happened, right? I mean, and, and now more than ever, and I, I personally, myself, like walking into so many places, so many rainbows, yes, celebration, but there is a question, right? So, and the question is, like, I even got to the point that, like, yes, we're seeing all these rainbows, um, but our pride and our humanity does not just end after June, the end of June, right? I mean, pride happens for all of us that, that uh, throughout the year, right? The questions that needs to arise is that question, how do we continue advocating for the rights of LGBTQ, trans, gender diverse people? Right? It's whether it's a consultation with uh, local communities that they're working in different initiatives. Uh, that's when organizations or private or private sector would say like we can't find the right trans person to this. It means they're just not doing enough. You know, that's an excuse. And questions um, that need to continue to be answered when it comes to private sectors that just wants to put that rainbow color and pink capital right for. <laughs> Why do, we, why do we need to create products in order to sell to marginalized communities? Why do we need to do that? So I think the pride conversation now more than ever has to, be, has to continue. So that's my comment on that. Um, we are uh, coming to the end of this particular um, first ever meeting and I wanted to ask um, the ambassador and executive director if they had any final closing thoughts or comments. Mm, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. And first, if I may, I would like to, to react to, to what my, my friend from Argentina has said. I'm sure that uh, the same that happened in Jujuy can happen in some other provinces of Argentina or around the world, of course. And uh, the fact that uh, or in some neighborhoods of Buenos Aires. You know? But this all, as the British ambassador said, said culture theme that we should change. We can have the best legislation and we didn't we don't have enough education and we don't work on that, we will never, never improve the LGBTI situation of the persons of this. Uh, so that's why I think this uh, culture issue that we should work, work harder. And about the final remarks, as I said at the beginning, really, I mean, I, I'm very very proud to be here, and I believe that this sort of discussion gives us the opportunity to learn from the inspiring and excellent experiences of all and uh, all the stakeholders in this uh, and give more visibility to the problems faced by LGBTI persons. So thank you very much for inviting me on and be part of all these uh, kind of events. Thank you. I also want to start by, again, thanking uh, all of you for making this uh, day possible and meaningful, and hopefully one of the many uh, days uh, uh, like this. Once the genie is out of the bottle, we can never put it back. We can only move forward uh, uh, from here. Um, I, I just want to end by highlighting the importance of putting uh, the kind of consciousness that we want 
in the DNA of the institutions that must safeguard people's rights. Uh, if it's in the US or anywhere else in the world, let's make sure that uh, it's not just the administration of the particular time that we're concerned about. We have to continue to work with law enforcement, with the judiciary, with whoever else that has a, a, a responsibility for the, in the ecosystem to sustain the rights because uh, we are in these struggles where sometimes one part of the institution will see things the right way and another part will not. And you need to find a way of utilizing the other parts of the, of, of, of the system to keep the system accountable, to hold it together and to, and to move forward. I think for me right now, uh, in some countries, uh, including the US, the role of, uh, of uh, cities is very important because people live in cities. And there we could find that uh, if we lose some benefits elsewhere, we could make sure that we strengthen the capacity uh, elsewhere without giving up on the bigger picture because everyone has to take responsibility. So it's this thing of having to negotiate and see which space you need to seize. That's always been the case, I guess, when you fight for rights. Mm -hmm. It was the case for us in South Africa when we were fighting for apartheid. Uh, sometimes you chose your battles and who to fight them with uh, in order to make sure that you sustain uh, the momentum. And I would say also in the case of private sector, uh, leveraging the resources uh, so that they're invested uh, in the people who need them most, but also the transformation of the private sector itself is an important gain that we should focus on because when people who run the institutions uh, become believers, and uh, 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 is concerned, then they will also themselves see how they do things in such a way that uh, they, they make the right choices. And lastly, for the United Nations, there is no way we can talk about leaving no one behind uh, and not bring everything that is about the violation of rights in our radar screen. And, uh, it therefore becomes one of the core values of the SDGs to make sure that uh, we rise up to the occasion as far as this agenda is concerned. Thank you. Well, we've been able to cover a lot of ground today. We understand that there is a lot of work to do to secure essential rights, but then to make sure that those rights translate into people's everyday lives on the ground culturally. We've learned that we need to work intersectionally. We've learned that we need to bring people from the outside into the process. Um, we've learned that we need to uh, involve the private sector. And we've learned um, that it starts basically with us thinking about how we speak to each other and the language that we use. So there is a broad and wide ranging agenda, lots to be able to pick up on next year. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. Let's thank all of our guests and this entire panel. And this meeting is adjourned. <laughs> You're learning, huh?